So in this video, I'm going to do a quick review and then give you the pieces that you need to get ready to start analyzing data from your experiment. So just real quick, you, if you remember, why are we worried about experiments as engineers? Because we need data. We need data to make decisions, and often that data comes from doing an engineering experiment. So we've got to design a good way to get the data, collect it, and then properly analyze it so that we can draw conclusions. And we do experiments to gain information for a decision. So the decision is no better than the experiment, and the experiment needs to be only good enough for the decision. It doesn't need, it can't be, you can't give data that's, that's not accurate enough to make the decision, but you also don't need data that's way, way, way more accurate than the decision that you're trying to make. Okay. And this was the process we said we're going to follow every time. And this is a process, habits that you want to develop that when you're on the job and you need to do an experiment to get data, you follow these things. And we said, okay, we're going to start with designing a solid measurement process so that we get good data. You've got the DOE guide and the DOE summary to help you that. But we emphasized you are designing. You're, you are looking at what information do I need and how am I going to design an apparatus or a process or whatever to really get that. Then we'll take the data. After that, step number two, we're going to make sure it's valid. We're going to talk about that in this video. And then we've got good data. Then the last step, we're going to start doing the actual engineering analysis on it. You need to do all three of these steps to really be able to have confidence that the information you're using to make your decision is solid. Okay, so because we're taking data, we're worried about the real world and problems with data. The first thing we said is everything has variation. There's variation in everything. That's one of the difficulties. So we said, well, how do we know what, what, what we can expect from something? And we said, okay, if the process is stable, random, common cause variation, we define what that is a little bit later. Otherwise, the world's a nice place. Everything's holding still. Then the pieces of information you collect, the measurements you take, are random variables. That means they behave in a predictable manner described by distribution. And if you remember, we're like, every time we say that, we're like, predictable, what do we mean? And we saw this video here from the Galton board. Just giving the example of here's these beads falling down. Every time they hit one of those pegs, they can go either direction. A bunch of them fall down and they fall in this pattern every single time. And you can think about every one of those left or right decisions as things happen in the plant driving your measurements. And so when we say it's a random variable, we can't tell you where any one ball is going to fall, but we can tell you the pattern. That's the whole idea with it being a random variable. We would expect the parts to fall within bounds. In this case, most of them fall in the middle, a few fall to the outside. But this is just a physical representation of random variables really, really do exist. That's how things happen and why we can count on them. And so we said there's different patterns that they follow. There's a uniform pattern. There's an F, what's called an F distribution. And then the normal distribution, which lots of processes follow. And what's nice about that is the probability of something happening is based upon the number of standard deviations you are away from the average. And that's really convenient for us because it makes it real easy to know what we can expect from something, a random variable following the normal distribution. And we said, okay, because of that, like this is really what we're going to see. So when we report a number, it's really not fair just to give the average because without giving some idea of the uncertainty, we're not giving that person full information because they are going to get parts on either side there. And then the other thing we pointed out is that we are assuming that our process is normal. So like this thing making parts or whatever, it's normal with an average and a standard deviation. If you're trying to predict where individual measurements will fall with this, then you need to verify that it really is normal. Now, we're going to learn later that's not true with averages. 
If you're just worried about where the average of something is going to be, this normal assumption isn't important. And like I said, we'll see that later, but I just wanted to point that out. Okay. And so we said, okay, we're going to ask three questions of data. The first is what can I expect from you? And we know because of random variables that if it's only common cause variation, what can I expect? I can expect an average and plus or minus two or three standard deviations. I can do a confidence interval. I have a, a band of where I'll expect those parts to fall. And if it's normal, I know most will fall in the middle and then they'll spread around. Okay, the second problem with the real world is it doesn't always hold still. You've heard me say it like the world is not a nice place. There's lots of things that can move around. And we saw like with Bolt, okay, we're gonna take a sample but we've got this population, a plant that's making bolts, and it might be making them consistently, and we grab a sample here, or it might be making bolts inconsistently, and we happen to grab a sample here, but we might have grabbed one there. Or the standard deviation might be inconsistent, or they both may be inconsistent. Whatever, the world's not a nice place, and what we're doing is we never really know the real population, all we get to do is take samples. And from those samples, we're gonna calculate a sample standard deviation and an average, and we're using those to estimate the real population. And the question that we're always gonna ask ourselves since we never know the reality is, we're estimating reality with these, so the key question says, is our sample a good representation of the reality? That's always what we're asking. And we saw this picture just to visualize, okay, here's the real population and we're going through and we're taking samples. And so we may have got some up here, one down here, then we're gonna calculate an average and what's always gotta be on our mind is does that average represent reality? For us, no it doesn't. Because what reality? Because the population's changing. The same thing with the standard deviation. So in this case, we would say, the process is not stable. There's not just randomness going on. There's some special cause. Something is making that change. And so that whole idea of sampling with the world not being a nice place is why we said we always want to randomize the order. Because if we were checking heat treating and this is what our factory looked like making parts, and it just so happens we got parts right here and said those are heat treated, we got parts right here and said those are not heat treated. We would look at those and probably say they're different and falsely conclude that it was heat treating when it wasn't at all. So that's why we randomize the order to spread out whatever's happening if the population of the world is not a nice place. Now, let me say, it's still not a good situation that we took data when the world was not a nice place. But if we randomize it, you're going to see later, we might get an idea that the world wasn't a nice place when we were taking data. So we can stop and go back and look and see what's really going on. Okay. And then we saw this, it kind of pulls all this together where we said, okay, anytime we take measurements and we ask why they're different, they could be different just because, or they could be different because something special, just because it's the drill just wiggling. It's random which means it's operating consistently based upon a distribution, a pattern, it's predictable. So it is stable, there's only common cause, so we could use an average and a standard deviation to estimate the actual. Or there's something special happening, like here, something changed, something specific, the drill moved, so it's not random, it's not consistent, the process is not stable, so we can't use the average and the standard deviation to estimate what's going on. We've got to understand those issues and resolve them. So if we're doing an experiment, it's really important for us to know the information that we collected, are we up here or are we down here? Because if we're down here, we can't use that data to make a good decision. If we do, our decision is going to be based on faulty information and it may be a wrong decision. So it's really important to know this. And, and you remember we saw this example where we said, okay, look at this graph right here. It's got an average of this, a standard deviation of that. 
is it just bouncing around randomly? Looks like it is to me. So yeah, we could, we could use those to describe that data. Then we came over here and we said, no, there's a special cause there. I mean, think of it. Think of our normal distribution. If this is a normal distribution and it's just bouncing around like this, would we all of a sudden expect parts to be bouncing around like out of three standard deviations? No, we wouldn't. Same thing down here. If I've got parts and they're just bouncing like this, would I all of a sudden start expecting to get parts here and down here, a lot of parts? No, I wouldn't. Something happened there. It's not just random. So we could not use that average in the standard deviation to describe the data. But the only way we would have never known that is to look at the data, to graph it. And that's where we use this big stop sign and we said, look, never ever use an average to describe data that you haven't seen. Because when you average, you're saying that this average represents the data. If the data is not stable, it can't represent it. You don't want to combine things into averages until you've looked at the data to make sure it's okay to combine them. If it does have consistency, then you have reasonable assurance that that average really represents the, the, the real thing. And so you can do that, but you don't want to do it until you look at it. Okay, so we said when we're doing our experiments, everything's got variation. The real world doesn't always hold still. So how do we tell if the world is nice? How do we tell if the process is stable, if it's random? How do we tell when we take data for our experiment if we're up here in the top so that we can do our engineering analysis. Well, here's what we're going to do. We're, we remember the normal and you've seen before where I turn it on the side and I say, look now, if I plot points, they should be randomly spread. Most of them should be in the center. I'll see a few out, but it should just be random. No, no special kind of pattern. So that's what we're going to do. So after we design our experiment and collect the data, the next thing we're going to do is make sure the data is valid. How do we do that? We're going to plot the data in the order it was taken. The data should have been taken randomly, so our data should be randomly spread. And we're going to ask, am I seeing what I would expect if it was just a random distribution just bouncing around? So for instance here, heat treated parts, there's the ultimate. I look, do they look like they're just bouncing up and down about the average? They do. Am I seeing what I would expect? I don't see anything weird. Yep, I would say, okay, that data is valid. That's all we're looking at. If you've, you've, you've seen these graphs a couple times, you've graphed them. So if I look at these, all of these are random, just common cause. I don't see anything strange. What am I doing? I'm thinking about it like right here and I'm saying, are these just bouncing consistently up and down? Do I see anything strange in any of these? No. This one's bouncing more, but that just means it has a higher standard deviation. Remember, this is the, the average and standard deviation we use to create this. Yes, it does. But then down here, when I look at this and if I say, okay, if it's just randomly bouncing like this, would I all of a sudden expect it to be up here? I mean, completely out of three standard deviations and all of it up here? No, I wouldn't. No, that's special cause. So if you do your experiment and collect data and your data looks like that, something changed while you were doing it. Now, if this is all heat treated, this is all not heat treated, well, that makes sense. But if this is all supposed to be not heat treated, something happened, your, your machine lost calibration, something happened. Same thing right here. Notice the same thing. Whoops. If it was just bouncing around right here, would all of a sudden I expect it to start bouncing way out like that? No, I wouldn't. Okay, so you get the idea. You're checking everything you measured to ensure that you've got a stable process. Your part and your measurement variation is stable before you go on and start doing engineering analysis. So you're going to plot it in the order it was taken. Then you're going to sort it by any independent variables and then run order. And let me show you what I mean by that. I'm going to give you a couple examples. So here's the wind tunnel. And we're going to measure the velocity with a pitot static tube. 
So the air is going to come in. There's a manometer. The difference in the height there is going to give us the ability to predict the wind speed. So what we'd like to do is to be able to say for the wind tunnel, for a certain RPM, what's the wind speed? Create a relationship. So we go through the DOE guide. Our dependent variable is going to be delta pressure, which we then can use to calculate wind speed. Our independent variable is going to be RPM. And the levels are going to be 1,000 to 3,500 in those increments. Our background variables are going to be temperature, barometric, how they're reading, the manometer, and all those things are going to be held constant. So for instance, like RPM, we're always going to go up to the RPM. So even if we have a lower one, we're going to go below it and come up to it. In case there's hysteresis or something like that, we're always going to go. So all those things are going to be held constant. We're going to take four measurements at each RPM. We're going to completely randomize it. So we put all our RPMs four times, random number, we sort it, and there's our run order. So we do that, and then we plot the data in run order. So there's all of our design. We plot it right there. And I look at that graph and I don't see anything strange. It just looks like it's randomly bouncing up and down. So everything's good. Then I sort it based upon RPM and then run order. So that's this graph right here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look to make sure that only variation that was present is either random variation or variation that I put there by changing the RPM. So I'm going to look inside of each one of these. And what I'm looking for is randomness inside of there. So when I look at these, again, I don't see anything strange. They look pretty consistent. So I would say, yep, everything is good. Best that I can tell, the process was stable. The data is valid. Let's move on to engineering analysis. Okay, so now what if my data looked like this? See, notice. If I was bouncing around like this, would I all, all of a sudden expect to get a point down there? Um, no, I wouldn't. That's in statistics what we call an outlier. It's not what we would expect for common, you know, just random variation. It's a sign of special cause. Something happened. So what do you do about it? From a pure statistic standpoint, you throw it out. You call it an outlier. You assume it was a mistake or something happened. It does not fit the pattern of the rest of this, so you throw the piece of data out. As an engineer, it depends upon how good a number you need. Because remember, the world's not a nice place. What if the wind tunnel every now and then had glitches and its RPM dropped? So what if that wasn't an outlier, that that really is something that happens with the wind tunnel? So it does show up sometimes that way. If you threw it out, you would ignore that. So the first thing you're going to want to do is go look at your notes, which means when you're taking your data, you need a notebook. You need to be writing everything down that happens. Oh, John knocked the setup over and we had to put it back up after run number five. You want that written down. So if you see a glitch run number five in your data, You've got stuff like that in your notebook to say, oh, okay, that was right after we set things up. Yeah, I'm comfortable getting rid of that because I, I realize why that happened and then we corrected it. Um, sometimes you've got to do more testing to understand that. And you, you've got to weigh how much it really matters to you and then throw that point out at your own risk. Sometimes that one point doesn't change the average enough that it's not even enough to sweat over. So do you move on to engineering analysis? That's a question mark. I can't tell you. That's up to you. You've got to decide what to do about that point before you go on. Me personally, in this case, I probably would. That one point isn't going to change it that much. Um, I would probably get rid of that point in this case. Okay, so let me give you another example. So we're measuring delta pressure which gives us the flow in the flow rig. You'll learn in fluids, there's an equation that converts the, the two. There's an orifice plate here. We're measuring the pressure on either side of it, and it can give us the flow rate in there. 
So I want to know the relationship between the flow and the delta pressure. So same kind of thing. My dependent variable is going to be the delta pressure. My flow rate is going to be my independent, and there's my levels. And my background variable, mainly water temperature, and I'm going to record it. And then if it's significant enough where it changes the density, I'll adjust for it. So I've, I've done my experiment. I took all the data. I'm going to plot it in run order. Then I'm going to sort. So six samples at each one. I do all my um, randomizing. And there's my data. I plotted it in run order. And you're like, well, whoa, look at that. That doesn't look random. Well, no, but notice point number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, look, I've got two nines right in a row. Well, of course those. Yeah, yeah. See, we're going from the flow rate of one to nine. So that's why you see all these clumps together. So this graph right here in this case really doesn't tell me a whole lot. Remember what I'm looking for. I want to make sure there's no variation there except randomness and what I put there. Well, I put that there. So that's why we're going to plot it in first, sort it by flow rate, and then run order. And so now I'm going to look inside of each one of these, and I would expect them to just be random. But they're not. Look, every point is higher than the one before it. And I'm seeing that at every flow rate. That's not normal. What's random? Random's up and down, remember? It's bouncing up and down about an average. That is not random. So I would say, okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's not what I would expect. Something other than flow is impacting it. Like maybe it's heating up. So as it's heating up, um, it's causing the flow to change. Now, in my case, I was measuring the temperature so I could check that. Maybe it was something the electronics were heating up and the readings were rising. I don't know at this point. That's where, as the engineer, you've got to go and explore it. But for your experiment that you're trying to get information to make a decision, you got to stop. If you make decisions based on this data, it's faulty because your data is not valid. Okay? Make sure that you get that. That's what we're trying to see. That's why. We plot it in run order to make sure our data is valid. And I want to show you the importance of this sorting it by the independent variables. Okay, so this right here is just plain old run order with no temperature impact. This data, it has a slope to the data based on temperature. Now, when you look at this and this, you can't see that. If you look really closely, you see that point. Notice it's raised up over here. This whole graph slopes up. The whole thing slopes up, but you can't really tell that. It's so slight, but look what happens when I plot it in run order. The same graph with just a slight temperature increase, plotted in run order and then plotted by, by flow rate, you know, sorted by whatever your independent variables are, then by run order, Notice how it shows up. It just sticks out like a sore thumb. So that's why when we are trying to say, is the world a nice place? Are we up here with our data? The first thing we're going to do is plot it just in run order. Then we're going to sort it by independent variables. We want to do both of those. Am I seeing what I would expect to see? Okay. So that's the first thing to learn from this that's new. When you take your data, that's how you're going to make sure that the data is valid and that it's a nice place because the real world doesn't always hold still. So you come and you have data like this and you can say, no, something's, yeah, is that what I would expect? No, I'm down here. I'm not up here. I'm down here. Something has changed. So no, that average and standard deviation does not represent the data. What's the ultimate? I can't tell you based on this data. Or you look over here and you're like, you know what? That's just bouncing around. I'm up here. It's just pure random. The process is stable. I can do engineering analysis or whatever afterwards that I need to be. What can I expect from ultimate? I can tell you right there. Okay. 
that's that that first step in plotting in a run order. That's what you're trying to ask yourself. Do I have good data? Okay, so we said three problems. Everything's got variation. The real world doesn't hold still. And then many things impact what you're measuring. Lots of things impact it. We've said with 3D printing. Okay, the fill rate, the orientation. How about batch? You print three different batches. Are all three batches exactly the same? Any of those things could affect. So that's why our step number one is going through this whole process to design a good experiment so that when we make that decision, we sleep good at night knowing that we, we accounted for variation. We accounted for the world not being a nice place and we accounted for all the things that could be affecting our dependent variable and we're sure that the results that we saw were only from our independent variable, what we changed. That's why we go through all this to design our experiment. And that's what you're practicing now in your semester project so that when you do it for real on the job, you can do it well. Okay, so now let's start to transition like data from your project. What do we do? So let's say we're worried about this material right here. What is the heat from this doing to it? How does heat treating affect that material right there? So that we know how it impacts it for strength calculations that we need to do. So we're asking what value can I expect? Now we're bringing in the second question, which is, is data set A the same as data set B? So if you want to think about it, did heat treating matter? We've got data set A, parts that weren't heat treated, data set B, parts that were heat treated, and what we want to know is, are they the same? Did heat treating matter? Are they the same? If they are the same, heat treating didn't matter. If they're not the same, heat treating did matter. So now we're into the second question right here. And just review, we know what it looks like. Here's the reality, we're taking samples, we're taking them based upon our measurement system that we designed to give us the accuracy and the precision that we need. We then pull those, we've got our data. We're gonna look at that data in order to answer that question about this reality to make a decision. That's what you're really doing with your experiment when you start to get your data and then begin to analyze it. So, we did this piece right here and we followed this, we designed our experiment, and so here's what it looks like. So our dependent variable is yield strength, the pounds, and its area, so we're measuring length and we're measuring width. Our independent variable is heat treating. We either heat treated it or we didn't heat treat it. Notice that up here, length and width are a dependent variable because I'm going to need to measure those for every part. They're just dependent on the part. I'm not changing it. It's just what they are. Background variables. Which specimen? I'm going to use one bag and randomly pick 10 to heat treat and then 10 to not heat treat. The heat treating, I'm going to do them all at the same time so there's no batch problem. The machine calibration, I'm going to verify it that it's been on for 30 minutes, verify that I calibrated it. Loading, one person's gonna load, a load it. They're gonna verify the specimen protect. They're gonna verify the position. The pull rate, it's gonna be constant. Other, I'm gonna randomize the order of all the 20 samples. And so here's what I've got. I've got level one, not heat treating. Yes, heat treating. I'm gonna have 10 samples for each one. I'm gonna lay them all out sort them. There's my order that I'm actually going to test the parts in. Okay, so I do that and I get all the data. So now I've got all the not heat treated data, all the heat treated data, and then I'm going to hit step number two. I'm going to verify the data is valid. So for everything I measure, I'm going to plot it in run order, and I'm going to plot it sorted by the independent variable. And now this step isn't necessarily something that you would put in your lab report unless there was an issue. You would do the graphs, you, you, you can talk about that, that you verify the data, 
but like this would not be a, a, a main attraction that would be in your lab report. You just need to do it to make sure that your data is valid. So for us, I graphed my length measurement in run order and sorted. I did my width measurement and I did my yield, the ultimate, the pounds. None of them showed any signs of anything but randomness. So I've got good valid data. So now I'm ready to go on to step number three and start drawing engineering conclusions. Okay, so I want to show you a couple things on the data itself that then you'll see as we go through the information. Okay, first of all, when we look at this, any two points, why are they different? Well, if the experiment was designed well, the only difference is randomness, normal variation that they're acting in a predictable pattern. And this standard deviation of these is what I'm going to call my within sample variation. You're going to see this term later. I just want you to see that's how much variation I have within my non heat treated parts. Same thing over here. I can get a standard deviation for this. That's how much variation I have within my heat treated parts. Now, if I look from here to here, that's my between variation. Remember, I have two data sets, A and B, or I can have three, A, B, and C. I have within, how much variation is there within each one? And then I have between. This is the between. And what I'm going to do is say, based upon how much within variation I have, how much would I expect to see between those? If what I expect to see is how much I see is what I would expect to see, then heat treating didn't have an impact. If it's more than what I would expect to see, then yeah, that factor did impact it. So like I said, this is what we're going to do. And then you'll see as we unroll this, what we're doing, how it fits into this, this picture actually shown on the data. Okay, so let's say this is what our data looks like right here. I've got a line graph and it's sorted by heat treat, yes and no, and then run order. So that's the order that the non-heat treated were taken in. That's the order that the heat treated were taken in. So the first thing I'm going to do, oh, and the boxes are there just to help me visualize. You don't have to put them. I like them because it just helps me visualize the different chunks that I have. Heat treated, not heat treated. Sometimes you'll have multiple of those. So the first thing I'm going to ask myself is, okay, is this random? Well, yeah. I mean, I've already looked at it, but I'm looking at it again. When I remember when I plotted it in run order sorted, I said it was, yes, it is random. That means only common cause. So that's saying that I can use that average and standard deviation to describe that. Same thing for the other one. Yes, it is. I can use that average and that standard deviation to describe it. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, yeah, it is what I expect for each one. It's only common cause. So I can kind of view these like this and I can say, okay, this is basically what I would expect out of this. Based upon the average, I could go three standard deviations. I've just sort of eyeballed it here, showing you this idea. That's what I would expect from that. That's what I would expect from that. So now what I'm going to do is to get to this question, is data set A the same as data set B? Did heat treating matter? I'm now going to ask myself, okay, there's the within variation. Based upon the within, what do I think about the difference between these guys? That's what I'm focusing on. And the way I'm going to do that, the first method, is I'm going to compare these graphs using a rough confidence interval from this set right here. I'm going to focus on this guy. And here's what I'm going to ask myself. If this is my process and it's stable, would I expect to see data like this from it? So let's say this was my distribution, an average of 80, standard deviation of one. So it's bouncing up and down here. If this was the case, would I randomly expect to see data up here? Is the difference between more than I would expect based upon the within? 
is the difference between random or caused by something. So look, if it was bouncing around like this, would I all of a sudden expect to see parts up here? Think about it like this. If I turn this back sideways and say, okay, this is the within, look at where the between is. I mean, the, the heat treated. If this, is, if this is my not heat treated right here, look where heat treated is. It's like all the way up in here. See, look, it's like from here all the way up. Would I randomly expect to see that? No, I wouldn't, right? Random variables, they act in a predictable pattern. What's the pattern? Well, they're all going to be spread through here. Most are going to be here. I'm going to see a few here and here. Would I expect to see a pattern where they're all up here? No, I would not. So, heat treating mattered. When I look at between, it's not what I would expect to see based upon the within variation. That's the question you're always going to ask yourself. Is data set A the same as data set B? Did what you do make a difference? You're going to look at your first one and say, okay, if this is the distribution, would I expect to see something like this? Yes, I would. Then it didn't matter. No, I wouldn't. It did matter. In our case, it did matter. So you can think of it like, okay, this difference right here is special cause. It's not just varying randomly, this between difference. No, something changed it we're not going to be up here just for nothing. So the variation between data sets is much larger than you would expect based on the, the variation within. So the between is not random, heat treating mattered. That's the process that we're going to follow. The first method, looking at the two data. But you're always asking, based upon what I see here, would I expect to see that? Okay, so is data set A the same as data set B? If there's only common cause variation in A and B, we got that same thing. If you say they are the same, well, then you can just combine them. Let's say we found out heat treating didn't matter. Well, then you could just combine all of them, get an average and standard deviation, and summarize and say, here's, here's the ultimate for my parts, and heat treating doesn't matter. If you find out it does matter, A and B are not the same, then you have to summarize each one separately. So for us, heat treating did matter. So here's what I can expect. If it's not heat treated, you can expect this. If it is treat treated, you can expect that. So you see, I've got to tell them to you each separately. If I had three or four different levels, then I would do the same thing for each of those levels. Okay, so, is set A the same or different from set B? We're going to compare the graphs using a rough confidence interval from the first set. We're going to look at set A, set B, and say, if my process was stable, would I expect to see what I'm seeing on B? Is the difference more than I would expect based upon the within? And then that other question, is the difference random or is it caused by something? So that's the first thing we're going to do to try to see, did what we do matter or is set A different from set B? Asking that question. So here's another example. We're going to do the same thing. Does that look random? Yep, it does. We can use an average. The second one looks random. Everything looks good. Now we're going to say, okay, how about between? Does this, the difference between here and here look random? If my process was doing this, would I expect it to do that? And I'm going to do the same thing like I did before. I'm going to bring this guy. And notice now, here's our not heat treated. It's sitting here like this. So did heat treating matter? Um, I'm not as quick to say. I mean, it's skewed off to the side, so I think it mattered. But it's... Uh, it's a little harder to say. And so that's the case. This first thing we do here by comparing graphs, it really only helps us when the difference is a no-brainer. So let me show you what I mean. Like, look at these. It's a no-brainer. If I look at set A, I'm saying set B is out here off the chart. If I look at this one, I'm saying, okay, here's set A. Set B is way down here off the chart. It's a no-brainer. 
Whatever I did between set A and set B mattered. They're not the same. If it was just sitting here doing this, it's not all of a sudden going to do that. Same thing down here. I'm saying set B, it's all right in here. I mean, whatever I did made no difference. It's a no-brainer. Set A and set B are the same. Even these two are pretty much no-brainers. You know, you look what I'm saying. I'm saying set B is all here on the end right here. Set B, it might be overlapping a little bit, but really not much. If it's just bouncing around in here, would I expect them all to bounce like this? No. So you see, these are what I call no-brainers. But now look at these two. There's a good bit of overlap. Could that have happened randomly? Uh, well, I'm not quite as quick to say no, it could, it, that, that it couldn't have happened randomly. So what that's telling us is we need another tool. That this method right here is just one way. That's our first way. That's the first thing you do. If it's a no-brainer, you're done with it. The next thing you're going to do is we're actually going to put confidence intervals on the average and compare them. So what we'll, what we'll do is we'll check to make sure they're stable. Once we know they are, we're going to calculate an average for each of those. And then what we're going to be asking is, is this difference in random, in difference in average random or special cause? And we're, we're in class together, we're actually going to learn another tool that will help us more definitively answer that question, okay? So that'll be later. So let me tie up what we've done. We've said, okay, you're planning your experiment. You're going to go through these steps. Step number one is really important because lots of things impact your variables. The world's not a nice place. There's variation. So you've got to carefully plan your experiment. Step number two, to make sure the world was a nice place, you're going to plot it in run order. Then you're going to sort by your independent variables in run order and plot and make sure that within each of those is just randomness, that there's not some kind of pattern. Then step number three, you're going to start your engineering analysis. And when you ask, is this data the same or different? You're going to look at the set one and say, okay, if this is reality, what would I expect to see in the second set? And so one thing we're going to do is we're going to compare graphs. That works for the no-brainers. The next thing, which I mentioned, is we're going to do a confidence interval on the average. The last thing, which I haven't mentioned, again, which we'll do together in class, is we're going to perform something called a t-test, which can give us very conclusive evidence on is A or B different, okay? So that really gives you the foundation that you need to understand what you're going to start doing with your data. And then in class together, we'll look at confidence intervals and t-tests so that you will be able to completely analyze the data from your experiment and make very strong engineering conclusions.